starts right now. Uh, for those of you who are eager to visit Mom tomorrow, uh, don't forget we've all done a great job working together to slow the spread of this disease, flatten the curve. So remind uh, uh, all the members of your family that uh, we have worked to thank Mom from afar before, and this is one of those times where it's important to do so. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg tonight reminding San Antonio that even on Mother's Day, it's important we continue to remain socially distant and wear face masks when out and about. And just before this message, the mayor revealed the latest numbers for Bear County. As of tonight, there are 1,887 confirmed cases, with seven of those new cases confirmed at the Bear County Jail. We have 56 deaths in our county and 62 patients remain in the hospital. 970 people have recovered from COVID-19. Tonight, County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez revealed only 3% of those recovered have donated plasma. He's urging more to do so if possible, as it may help others recover as well. Temporarily closed and still no plans to open back up. As non-essential businesses continue to reopen here in Texas, tattoo parlors have not made the list, which means frustration continues to mount for some local owners. Yeah, the night team Stephen Cavazos took their complaints to tonight's daily briefing with the mayor, hoping to get them some clarity. These are practices that we've done since the beginning of time. And those practices put on pause. Teresa Bay is the owner and operator of two local tattoo parlors, Golden Rose Tattoos and Ink Master Studios. Both have had their doors closed and still have no anticipated date to reopen. We are just closed right now, pretty much indefinitely. Hair salons, massage parlors, and tanning salons got the green light to reopen on Friday, but under rules outlined by Governor Greg Abbott's task force. But Bay believes tattoo studios should have been first on the list. We've worked hard to bring this industry um, into a professional light only to be shut down. She says professional tattoo studios follow health codes mandated by both the state and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That includes ensuring tattoo artists are licensed in bloodborne pathogens training, have CPR and first aid training, and wear protective gear. Bay says this letter is being sent around the state, asking for elected leaders to advocate for tattoo artists. Mayor Ron Nierenberg says that's the governor's call. The governor has taken the sole authority to begin to open up private sector businesses. The mayor says the city's focus is implementing health guidances, which reinforces the closures. He says the city still needs to look at data that shows the impact of physical distancing, but that takes two to three weeks. The mayor does hope to see tattoo parlors open as soon as possible, but... We can't do it too soon or we'll end up back where we began again. While the mayor asks for patience, Bay says the more time passes, more struggles are expected. We're already being negatively impacted. Now, the Texas Division of Emergency Management helps to determine which businesses are non-essential and which businesses can reopen. Now, we did reach out to the TDM for a comment on tattoo parlors. We have not heard back. Tim. Thank you, Stephen. It is also important to note for businesses that have reopened, if you're found to be violating city and state orders, they will receive citations. That's according to the mayor, who added if customers aren't protected and infection rates go up, the city will have to start closing businesses all over again. New on the night beat, an update to a story involving a wrong way drunk driving crash, which ended with the death of 21 year old Christopher Farias Jr. back in April. The Bear County District Attorney's Office has learned that the accused driver, 60 year old Hector Osorio, was found dead this past weekend of an apparent suicide. Osorio, who was also a cardiologist, was driving the wrong way on I-37 when he crashed into Farias, who died at the scene. Osorio was arrested for intoxication manslaughter, but was later released from jail on a $150,000 bond. Trial Division Deputy Chief Daryl Harris says they learned Osorio committed suicide in Atascosa County. Another new update tonight. A man who police say was shot several times at a convenience store overnight has died. The medical examiner confirmed the death but could not give any other details other than the man's age, which was 22. The shooting happened at the Carry On Convenience Store over on Northwest Loop 410. Police say a man walked into the store and started fighting with people inside. That's when someone there pulled out a gun and shot the victim several times. The victim taken to the hospital, that's where he later died. The gunman was taken into custody. So far, no word on any charges.
Another overnight shooting happening on the west side at a home on South Hamilton Avenue. Police say two men got into an argument which ended with one of them being shot. The victim was taken to the hospital in serious condition. Police are still looking for the gunman. Witnesses at the home told police the two men knew each other well. And San Antonio police tonight still looking for a suspect they say stabbed his roommate. This all happening in the 100 block of Bowden Street on the west side around 11 a.m. today. Police say the man was stabbed or the man stabbed his female roommate in the forearm and then took off. It's unclear right now what led up to that stabbing. A motorcyclist is recovering tonight after clipping a curb and crashing on the west side this morning. It happened just before 11 on the access road of Highway 151, not far from the Petrenko and Ingram Road exit. Police say after hitting the curb, he lost control and went rolling down an embankment. We're told that the man in his early 30s was not wearing a helmet. Around Texas tonight, emergency crews responding to a deadly Houston helicopter crash involving police faced even more danger on the scene than we first knew. As first responders were working to rescue tactical flight officer Jason Knox and pilot Chase Cormier from that downed HPD helicopter last weekend, they were being fired upon by a teenager. 19-year-old Joshua Trejedo was arrested at the scene and was later seen on surveillance video shooting at responding helicopters in that area. He was originally charged with tampering, but those charges have since been upgraded to two counts of aggravated assault, one for each officer and one of the helicopters he fired shots at. The HP helicopter was lower and had the searchlight on, providing the light to our first responders. They were pulling them out. Investigators say they don't believe Trejedo's gunfire caused the actual helicopter crash. That cause has yet to be determined. Also in Houston, the police officer who died in that crash was laid to rest today. Officer Jason Knox was a tactical flight officer for the department. Knox leaves behind his wife, children, parents, and grandparents. The HPD says the pilot who was with Knox is still recovering in a hospital. Taking a look outside the live cam tonight, we're sitting near 70 degrees here in San Antonio, but many spots across South Texas already falling into the 60s tonight. After what was a pretty comfortable day, we did have a decent amount of cloud cover around for your Saturday, but we'll see a lot more sunshine tomorrow for mom on Mother's Day. Overnight, we'll see temperatures fall into the upper 50s for a lot of us, so it is going to feel nice and cool out there early tomorrow morning. But soak it in because as we get into the middle and back half of next week, our morning lows We'll hover right around 70 degrees. The humidity will be coming back as well. So we'll get you all the details for your Mother's Day forecast coming up and also talk about our next chance of showers and storms. That's coming up in the full forecast. Tim. Thank you very much, Katie. A local church has joined other charitable organizations in stepping up to help families who don't have enough food during this pandemic crisis. This morning, volunteers with Resurrection Church took in donations from the community. Church officials say they managed to fill up 25 barrels in just two hours and 43 barrels for the total today at both of their church campuses. They say the goal is to fill 100 barrels to give back to food banks here in San Antonio and up in New Braunfels. There is hope and we're here to help and our plan is to make sure that everybody is fed. Just to give you an idea for reference, each barrel can hold up about 100 pounds of non-perishable food items. Pastor Ray Brown says they'll continue to do this and find even more ways to provide relief to the community. Now, we've all seen the birthday parades during the coronavirus pandemic, but one happening today was a bit different. Check this out. The community threw a surprise horse parade for one seven year old girl this afternoon. Little Juliana enjoyed both ponies and horses that trotted down the street to celebrate her big day. Her mother, Annette Nieto, said having a horse themed party was a no brainer because of her daughter's deep love for horses. To see the full horse parade, just visit our story on our website at ksat.com. Still ahead on the night beat as the world begins to mourn, we're taking a look back at the unforgettable career of music icon Little Richard, who has died at the age of 87. Plus, we know bills are starting to pile up for those who find themselves without job amid the pandemic. We'll share some advice to help make your money stretch until the next paycheck. And COVID-19 reaches the White House. How staff is reacting, plus disturbing new medical news out of New York, where children who have tested positive are now developing new symptoms.
The number of coronavirus cases continues to climb across much of the country, but states, including Texas, have begun reopening businesses anyway. Yeah, the economic toll has been devastating so far, with millions out of work and many struggling to feed their families. And this week, the first two reported cases among White House staffers. Here's ABC's Karina Mitchell with the details. As novel coronavirus cases continue to climb across the country, frustration over stay-at-home orders and lost income is also growing. This is wrong on every single level, and the, coll the collateral damage is going to be far worse. More than 20 million people lost their jobs last month, the unemployment rate nearing 15 percent, the highest since the Great Depression. We need food. My son was laid off. My job was laid off. States now grappling with how to get their economies reopened without sacrificing safety. 44 states easing restrictions, but only 12 are trending downwards in cases. And in 20 states, the numbers are rising. An ABC News Ipsos poll shows 64 percent of Americans say reopening now is too dangerous. Not all businesses will open at the same pace, to the same scale. And sadly, some businesses may not reopen at all. In New York State, which is still under strict stay-at-home rules, disturbing medical news. Although rare, more young children who tested positive for COVID-19 or have the antibodies now have symptoms similar to toxic shock syndrome or Kawasaki's disease. 73 cases in the state, three children have died. This is the last thing that we need at this time for parents to have to worry about whether or not their youngster was infected. The White House confirming its first cases and stepping up efforts to disinfect common areas in the West Wing. Just one day after President Trump's personal valet tested positive for COVID-19, the vice president's press secretary, Katie Miller, also testing positive. Miller is also the wife of senior White House advisor Stephen Miller. The president says he's not worried. We've taken very strong precautions at the White House, but again, uh, we're dealing with a uh, invisible situation. Also, the director of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, will self-quarantine for the next two weeks after having low exposure to a person at the White House who tested positive for COVID-19. Officials say he has no symptoms, is feeling fine, and will be working from home. Karina Mitchell, ABC News, New York. And just a quick reminder for those of you hoping to look up and see the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds flying high over San Antonio next week. It has been pushed back by a day and will now be on Wednesday, May 13th. The reason for that change has everything to do with the weather. And Katie's going to give us more details about that here in just a bit. Yeah, they don't mess around when it comes to the weather. They need yeah. pristine flying conditions. Mm -hmm. And we will have a chance of some storms across parts of Texas on Tuesday, and that is likely why they have pushed back the flyover until Wednesday. By Wednesday, still a very slim chance of a storm, but that's likely out in West Texas. So before we talk about Tuesday's rain chances, I want to take you to Monday. This is Monday afternoon, and I want you to look over uh, just south of the four corners there between Tucson and El Paso. These lines you see here, these are the upper level winds in the atmosphere. There's a little dip there. This this is what we call a short wave or a piece of upper level energy, a piece of rain making energy, if you will. This will be moving into Texas late Monday into Tuesday, and that is going to bring us our chance of some showers and storms as we get into Tuesday. I do think a higher coverage of rain will be possible north of us, mainly up closer to the I-20 corridor, but some of those storms, if they can organize, could move down to the south into central and south Texas. So there will be a chance of storms across the I-35 corridor as we get into Tuesday. So that likely is why the flyover has been pushed back a day. And as we look at the rain chances for next week, Tuesday is really the only day that sticks out here. However, we're going to be watching the middle and back half of next week very closely. We'll have to watch some of those storms that form over the West Texas dry line. A few of those could sneak into our far western counties as we get into the middle and back half of next week. Overall, widespread rain, unfortunately, is not in the forecast at this time. Today was a rain free day, even though we did keep a good amount of cloud cover around. We started off 60 this morning up to 78 this afternoon, much more seasonable for this time of year, but that was some seven degrees below average. Our average high in San Antonio is right at 85 degrees this time of the year with some more sunshine. Our friends off to the west of 35 did manage to sneak into the 80s this afternoon. It got up to 88 in Del Rio. You guys saw a lot of sunshine today. 
more of us will see sunshine tomorrow for Mother's Day. Getting cool out there now. A lot of us are in the 60s, still near 70 degrees here in San Antonio, still 78 out in Del Rio, and our dew points are nice and low, generally in the 50s. We've got a few spots starting to sneak back into the low 60s, but overall things are very comfortable out there because our air is pretty dry. Tonight we'll see our temperatures drop down into the upper 50s, so a very cool start to your Mother's Day tomorrow. With that low humidity in place, it will be a good morning to get out for a quick walk or jog if that's in your plans for tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, a little bit warmer than today because we'll see a lot more sunshine through the day tomorrow. High temperatures, low to mid 80s here in San Antonio, some upper 80s off to the southwest. But again, it'll be another comfortable day tomorrow with our dew points staying on the lower side. So you can expect dew points tomorrow to generally be in the 50s. So that's still feeling pretty pleasant out there, even the 40s. But look what happens as we get into Monday. More of this deep green color starting to seep back in, and that means our dew point numbers will be starting to climb. Monday morning, still don't think it'll feel too bad out there, but by late Monday night, certainly by Tuesday morning, these dew point numbers will be pushing upper 60s, low 70s, and you'll notice the humidity much more as we get into Tuesday. So a great day tomorrow for mom. It's going to be wonderful. Enjoy. I hope all the moms out there have a wonderful day. Monday, still a pleasant day with humidity staying lower, but then it's Tuesday that we really crank up the humidity and that's also our chance of an isolated shower or storm. Wednesday for the flyover, things will be looking much better. We'll have some clouds in the morning, but afternoon sunshine for the flyover. Very muggy through the back half of next week. And I mentioned we'll have to watch the West Texas dry line Wednesday through the end of the week. A few of those afternoon evening storms could move into our westernmost county, so that's always something we're watching, but we'll keep you updated as we get closer to that. Next weekend looks like a stronger storm system is in the forecast that could up our chances of rain just a bit and wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily because we're getting to the point where we really need to get some rain going here. So we'll keep you updated there in the meantime. Great weather for mom tomorrow. Oh yes, guys. perfect weather for a great mothers. Thank you, Katie. Uh -huh. All right, when it comes to sports, picking the right number is everything. Everybody wants to have the specific yeah. number that means something to them. And one of the new Cowboys is going to be wearing a very important number. Yes, number 88 is a key number for the Dallas Cowboys. Some of the best receivers in NFL history and Cowboys history have sported number 88. Rookie C.D. Lamb is going to wear that number. Is he up to the challenge? Plus, Patty Mills says give mom a coffee for a great reason. Coming up. I'm happy for CD. He doesn't have to come in and be the, you know, the the only guy or the main guy right away. And I think that's a great great setting for him to get his NFL career started. Oklahoma Sooners head coach Lincoln Riley is thrilled his guy CD Lamb was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in Big Board Sports. Patty Mills is one of the best shooting guards in the NBA, and he's an even better person. He's teaming up with eight local coffee shops tomorrow, Mother's Day, to help small local businesses while raising money for domestic violence victims in Bear County. Patty is calling it Give Mama Coffee. Whatever those eight coffee shops make, Patty will write a check double that amount and donate to Family Violence Prevention Services. The feedback from them has been um, unreal, and the amount of um, work and effort that they've gone in on their end to be able to pull this off. For example, um, a lot of these coffee shops, some of these coffee shops don't even open on Sundays, um, so they're coming in because they feel like this is a great cause. Um, some of them don't open as, as early as 7 o'clock um, if they open on Sunday. So we're doing a, a 7 a.m. To, to 2 p.m. Um, time span, um, but this is obviously an, an all-day thing. So if you can head to, if people want to head to their website, then that's another um, chance to to be able to purchase. Um, but they feel the the good in it. All eight participating coffee shops will be open from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. with curbside pickup only. It's a great way to support local and Patty Mills cause. And those places are Mildfire Coffee, Press Coffee, Theory, Indie Coffee Co. Brown Coffee, Estate Coffee Co., Scorpion Coffee, and Gold Coffee. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. After he was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in the first round, 17th overall, wide receiver CeeDee Lamb said he planned to wear number 10 in the NFL, but Cowboys owner Jerry Jones wanted Lamb to wear number 88 to honor his former Arkansas teammate and dear friend, number 88, Jerry Lamb, who passed away in December. 
Jerry told the media in honor of his great friend, we're going to have his namesake come in here and wear 88 just like Michael Irvin and Des Bryant and those guys. Wearing 88 in Dallas is a big deal and some want to know if Lamb is up to the task. His college coach at Oklahoma says, yes, he is. He's gotten used to having a, a lot of scrutiny and playing in a, you know, on a big stage here uh, at Oklahoma. And then obviously, you know, the Dallas Cowboys are, you know, just about the biggest days that there is in, in the professional uh, league. So I, I think CD will handle it well. You know, his he'll ultimately be, you know, gauged and, and kind of remembered on, on how he plays, not what number he wears. He's confident in who he is as a player. He's very gifted, and I think it's just going to get better and better and, Excited about that situation for him going into a, you know, an already you know very strong offense with a, a really good young quarterback. So I, I think it'll be a lot of fun to watch, and I would expect him to do very well. CD is definitely a fun guy to watch. Based on the NFL standings from last season, the Houston Texans 2020 schedule is tied for eighth most difficult with the Arizona Cardinals. Now, in theory, the Texans' first half of the season is brutal because five of their first seven opponents made the playoffs in 2019. Houston will face Kansas City and Baltimore right out of the gate. Texans receiver Randall Cobb is up for the challenge, especially against the Packers in Green Bay in Week 7. Yeah, you know, though I definitely skirt, circled that one on the schedule. Uh, you know, I, I lost to him last year in Dallas, so I'm excited to get another opportunity at my old team. Uh, but it, it's it's definitely going to be a tough road for us, opening up with four tough opponents. Um, you know, it's we're really going to find out what we're made of early in the game, early in the season. <laughs> yes, they will. Coming up later in sports, the Houston Dynamo are back doing individual workouts. And I'll tell you what, the guys are extremely excited they're back out there with their teammates. I'll tell you, Larry, I'm like more turned up about the Mother's Day story. Yeah, right. Such a sweet, sweet Isn't deal. Isn't that right very there. cool? <laughs> yes. Patty's a good dude. All right. <laughs> thank buy you. your mom some coffee. There you go. Yes. All, right. All right, Larry, thank you. <laughs> Coming up after the break, we are remembering a legend, a look back at the historic career of Little Richard. Sad news today, Little Richard, one of the chief architects of rock and roll, has died. The flamboyant singer had a string of hits in the 50s and a massive influence over music, with everyone from the Beatles to Bruce Springsteen covering his songs. Yeah, here's ABC's Zoreen Shaw with the details on the legendary musician's life. Born Richard Wayne Penniman, Little Richard was one of the founding fathers of rock and roll who helped shatter the color line on the music charts, helping to bring what was once called race music into the mainstream. I think we started that mixing thing, the interracial thing, before a lot of these other things started. You know, the music got good, and it just made me feel good that we was bringing the people together, that my music was bringing peace, joy, bringing happiness, contentment. Born December 5th, 1932 in Macon, Georgia, one of 12 children, leaving home at the age of 13 amid problems with his father over his sexual orientation. Walk to the east, she walked to the west, but she's the gal that I love best. Responsible for a string of hits in the late 50s, including Tutti Fruity, Keep a Knockin', Lucille, and Good Golly Miss Molly, driven by his pumping piano and gospel-styled vocals. Selling more than 30 million records worldwide, his influence over other musicians was staggering. His songs covered over the decades by everyone from the Beatles, the Everly Brothers, and Bruce Springsteen. Little Richard's stage persona with his pompadours, androgynous makeup, and beaded shirts set the standard for rock and roll showmanship. Richard himself calling Prince the Little Richard of his generation. When the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame opened in 1986, he was among the charter members along with Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly, and Jerry Lee Lewis, among others. Rock and roll is alive forever. In 1990, he was given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and in 1993, receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Grammys. The tributes now pouring in on social media to honor the rock and roll icon, including one from former First Lady Michelle Obama, who wrote, we are so lucky to have had him. Taking Little Richard was 87. Zorin Shaw, and, ABC and News, really Los Angeles. Turning back to the coronavirus, the U.S. Army is offering a $25 million contract to a tech company that can develop wearable sensors to detect COVID-19. The Army wants proposals that include existing technology. That's according to a memo sent out through a medical consortium. 
the sensor would be worn on the body, possibly on the wrist like a watch or even on a shirt or a belt. The Army wants the device to indicate if the person is having difficulty breathing or if they have a fever. If symptoms are detected, then the service member could be fully tested. The National Restaurant Association says they have lost three decades worth of jobs in just the last two months, including more than five and a half million jobs in April alone. That means restaurant employment has fallen to its lowest level since 1989 because of the pandemic. Yesterday, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics announced a national unemployment rate hovering near 15 percent and climbing. The national restaurant industry is now asking Congress for targeted relief for its industry and employees. Delta is suspending flights to 10 airports across the country until at least September. The airline says that this will affect cities with more than one airport already served by Delta. For instance, in Chicago, Delta will halt service to Midway, but will continue to fly in O'Hare. Delta will continue to serve San Francisco, but will put a hold on its flight to Oakland. The other airports include Hollywood Burbank, Long Beach, Westchester County, and Akron Canton. Delta says that the move is out of uh, considerations for his employees trying to limit their exposure to COVID-19. Meanwhile, some healthcare workers dealing with coronavirus are getting free vacations courtesy of American Airlines. American says that it's teaming up with Hyatt Hotels to donate trips to workers at New York's Elmhurst or Elhurst Hospital. More than 4,000 doctors, nurses, and assistants are eligible for the vacations there for three-day stays at locations in the U.S. and the Caribbean. To a consumer alert for you tonight, Jeep's latest Wrangler crash tests show an alarming tendency to tip over. As a result, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety is giving the latest Wrangler a marginal rating. That's the second worst of four possible ratings in that type of crash test. The Insurance Institute says their findings apply to the 2019 and 2020 editions. Fiat Chrysler points out that despite this, the Wrangler does meet or exceed all government safety standards. Take a look at this. NASA is making major progress on its Mars rover project with, with blast off just 70 days away. Engineers at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida have begun the process of putting the Mars bound rover into place for launch. The rover and other spacecraft components will ride on top of the Atlas V rocket. These are the first spacecraft components to come together for launch and they will be the last to separate when we reach Mars. The rover will search for signs of ancient microbial life on the planet on the red planet. So to come on the night beat with the unemployment rate only rising bills are starting to pile up for many Americans after the break some advice on how to manage your money to get through this crisis. As unemployment claims pile up, so do the bills. Good thing 90% of Americans are getting a stimulus check from the government. However, for many, it won't be soon enough to get them through this current economic crisis. 12 on your size, Marilyn Morris, with ways to prioritize and stretch that money. Manuela Martinez lost her job. Now she'll join the 33 million Americans who filed for unemployment in the last seven weeks. What went through my mind when I got laid off was like, how am I supposed to pay my electricity bill? How am I supposed to pay my rent? While also thinking about how am I going to set food on the table? Money experts say first get a handle on how much cash is coming in and what must be paid. You might have to focus instead on essentials such as rent or utilities or, or pharmacy bills. For credit cards, many banks are deferring payments and waiving fees for people suffering a pandemic hardship. If you get a hardship accommodation, make sure that your payments are reported as current on your credit report rather than delinquent so it won't impact your FICO score. Manuela's credit card companies gave her extra time. They've actually took an ownership to say, listen, you don't have to pay anything for the next three months. As for federally backed mortgages, the CARES Act may offer relief, but you can't just ignore the bill. The law actually doesn't kick in automatically. You have to contact your servicer and it doesn't say how you'll be asked to pay up afterwards. So your servicer should contact you about a month before the time is up to offer you a realistic payment plan. Whether it's your mortgage, rent, or any other bill, it's important to contact your creditors early and find out what your options are. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. 
Outside with live cam near 70 degrees on this Saturday night. We had a good amount of cloud cover around today, but that really started to clear out this evening and that will leave us with mostly clear skies tonight. And that is really going to help our temperatures to drop off nicely through tomorrow morning. So it's going to be a great morning to get out. Take the doggos for a walk, get a, a jog or run in yourself. We'll start off in the upper 50s tomorrow morning and we just need to relish in this because as we get into next week, humidity is back and our morning temperatures will be closer to 70 degrees. Not so nice. So a great day for mom tomorrow, but we do have a chance of rain in the forecast coming up next week. We'll talk about it in the full forecast. Taking a look at weather, beautiful day for all of our beautiful mothers out there tomorrow. Oh, it's going to be so nice tomorrow. And like I said, just really soak it in the next couple of days with humidity on the lower side because our low humidity days, they are numbered. High temperatures across the country today. We had triple digits off in the desert southwest. Meanwhile, up in the Great Lakes, northeast, 40s and 30s for high temperatures here in May. We were somewhere in the middle there, near 80 degrees. We'll take that, that's for sure. And looking at satellite and radar tonight, not only was it very cold up near the Great Lakes in the northeast, they had some snow today from portions of Ohio off across uh, Pennsylvania into New York. Even Central Park picked up a trace of snow today, but a lot of the heaviest snow fell in portions of eastern Maine today. Uh, near Bangor, Maine there, they picked up an inch of snow, and that is a record for today's date. But 8 to 12 inches of snow observed in far eastern Maine, closer to the New Brunswick border there. So uh, a rainy May day for parts of the northeast. There's a low pressure system there spinning. It'll work off into the Atlantic, but it had some nice cold air behind it, and that did help to support that snow. There is another low pressure system uh, moving out of Minnesota now. This also has some cold air behind it, and it will bring some snow to portions of Wisconsin and even Michigan overnight tonight through tomorrow morning. So some parts of the country will be dealing with some snow on Mother's Day. How about that? Temperatures tonight through tomorrow morning will take a nice tumble. Some spots across the country will wake up to temperatures below freezing tomorrow morning. Not the case for us here in South Texas. We will be a cool 58 degrees or so here in San Antonio. Many spots will be sitting in the 50s and low 60s as we start the day tomorrow. So it'll be very pleasant out there in the morning. Again, a great morning to get out for a quick walk or jog if that's in your plans. Mostly sunny skies tomorrow. So with more sun than we saw today, our afternoon temperatures will be up a little bit. We'll be 76 at noon, low to mid 80s in the afternoon. A few spots off to the southwest of San Antonio could certainly sneak into the upper 80s, but everyone will be treated to another day of low humidity tomorrow. So even though it'll be warm in the afternoon, it will be fairly comfortable. Now, as we get into Monday, Monday Monday still we're going to call it a comfortable day, but our dew point temperatures will be gradually climbing Monday such that by Tuesday it will feel very humid out there. And I also think Tuesday morning could be the first morning that we get back into those low morning clouds, then breaking through to a little bit of sun in the afternoon. Tuesday is in when we also have a chance of some isolated showers and storms here in South Texas. We talked about this last half hour. There is a chance of storms from North Texas down through the I-35 corridor on Tuesday, and that's likely why. The Air Force Thunderbirds have pushed their flyover back to Wednesday now instead of Tuesday because as we get into Wednesday, the likelihood of storms across central and south Texas will be lower. However, something I'm going to want to watch out for as we get into Wednesday evening, Thursday evening, even Friday evening of next week, the West Texas dry line could fire off some storms. Those could sneak into our far western counties through the back half of next week. So that's something we'll be watching. However, I'm going to keep the rain chance for San Antonio at a big old goose egg through the end of next week. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it does look like, though, by the start of next weekend, a stronger storm system could be approaching Texas, and that would help us out with better chances of rain. In the meantime, an absolutely beautiful Mother's Day for you tomorrow. I hope you get to get out and enjoy it. More pleasant weather on Monday, and then there's our next chance of a shower or storm on Tuesday. Certainly by Wednesday, we'll be back into that lovely pattern of muggy, overcast in the morning, and then just hot, humid with some sun in the afternoons. Guys. All right, Katie, it's too good to be true. We couldn't just have perfect <laughs> weather and keep it going the whole week. <laughs> you have no idea what it's like to hate winter until you live in Cleveland and it snows. In <laughs> Larry knows you've yeah. lived in Cleveland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some good news for Cleveland, though. One of the first facilities for the NBA to reopen. Yeah, about half of the league's 30 teams were allowed to open yesterday based on state, city, and, and local government. But Cleveland and Portland? Well, they were the only two that did open up. More on that. Plus, NASCAR will have to race the lady in black for real without practice. Coming up.
turn one at Darlington Dicey anyway. Well, what's that going to be like? <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be nutty to say the least. Next week, NASCAR gets back to real racing, and there won't be a lot of time for practice laps in big board sports. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver held a conference call with the Players Association and NBA Players Friday, addressing league-wide concerns about COVID-19 to prep the players for the challenge ahead. Should the season resume, Silver suggested a three-week training camp as the minimum length to get players ready. Silver said that no decision on the league season resuming needed to be made before June. He also pointed out that playing at one or two sites, including Orlando and Las Vegas, makes the most sense to start. And Silver also suggested there are no guarantees when fans could fully return to league arenas next season. That's just a handful of the topics Silver spoke about. Some NBA teams opened up for voluntary individual practice sessions were allowed, but few showed up yesterday. The Cleveland Cavaliers and Portland Trailblazers were the only two teams to unlock their practice facilities Friday. Cavaliers Kevin Love told ESPN that shooting was uplifting, and this is the longest he's ever gone without shooting a basketball. Meanwhile, at Portland, nine of the team's 11 players still in the area, including Carmelo Anthony, rotated through court times, sources told ESPN. Several teams have indicated that they will wait until at least next week to reopen. Some Major League Soccer players returned to work Wednesday for individual workouts. The Houston Dynamo reopened their facility for players Thursday morning. The guys had their temperatures taken as they arrived to the field. Players were wearing masks and they used hand sanitizers. MLS officials say the league worked with medical experts to come up with safety protocols to allow players to train while following state and local orders. Players are able to go through workouts stretched across six fields with four players per field to aid in social distancing. And the guys, well, they say it's awesome to be back. It was kind of a surreal feeling uh, pulling up to the training facility. Uh, it was You could see all the good work the, the people in the club has done, just creating these small spaces where we were supposed to be. And, and then walking in one by one kind of felt like you were in a lab or something. So it was it was pretty pretty surreal. But once you get in there, it was just a nice feeling. Uh, get some touches on the ball on a good field and being able to run freely uh, was just a nice nice feeling. And it was good to, good to be back. Uh, and I hope this could be a, a start for for uh, getting closer to to be playing out there in front of all of our fans. The Dynamo last played March seventh. NASCAR returns to real racing May 17th when the Cup Series takes on Darlington Raceway. The race at the historic South Carolina track will go down without fans in the stands. Darlington is known as a track too tough to tame, and the drivers will have to race her without practice or qualifying sessions. After seven weeks of iRacing, three-time Darlington winner Jimmy Johnson is ready to trade real paint. That has been highly frustrating for me to be competitive, but the machine and the platform itself can be very useful for situations like we're gonna have with no practice coming up. So I've run probably three or 400 laps already at Darlington just to get the rhythm and the feel and the idea of what to expect because I've never been cold turkey at a track before and rolled straight in and, and lined it up and raced. Drivers, stop your engine! Texans defensive end J.J. Watt was the Grand Marshal today for the seventh and final iRacing event held at historic North Wilkesboro Speedway. This is the first time any NASCAR event has been held on the course, virtual or otherwise, since 1996. And this one belonged to Denny Hamlin, who was a key figure in organizing the iRacing series. He won both the first and the final races. And I'll tell you what, J.J. Watt. He just pumps you up, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, I was excited, even though it was a fake race. Let's get the real stuff going. But it was a real start your engines. It very much was real. J.J. <laughs> Watt said it, it's real. That's right. <laughs> Stay with us. A cool 58 degrees early tomorrow morning up to the low 80s in the afternoon. A lot of sun and low humidity for mom tomorrow. Monday, another pleasant day, but by Tuesday we'll be sitting in some muggy air, and that's also when we have a chance of an isolated shower or storm back half of next week. Mainly just hot and muggy, guys. Would be nice to get some of that rain. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for watching. That's all of our time for tonight. That's right. Be sure to catch Good Morning San Antonio tomorrow morning starting at 6. Have a good night and happy early Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Good night.